his songs, isn't there? Um, but what the song is true, and it's a commitment, and it's very easy for us to sing those words glibly, but this is a commitment that we've made as we look into the week that's ahead of us, that we're going to be uh, working in the Lord's work because indeed it's true that the Lord's work doesn't just happen between 5 o'clock and 6.30 on Sunday afternoon, but all through the week. And we come tonight to God's Word to prepare us and equip us to do that more effectively. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer together and we'll come to the New Testament. Thank you, Father, for this imagery that we find in Old and New Testament books. We remember how Israel was the special vineyard that you formed for yourself and built a wall around it and dug it up and fertilized it and expected fruit and there wasn't any. And you decided to destroy it couple hundred years after Isaiah's time. We come to the New Testament and we think about the Lord Jesus Christ who explained to his disciples that he was in fact the true vine and that the only way to produce fruit was to be related to him by faith and dependency. We know that that's still true today and we pray that as we read these passages from the Bible this evening that as we prepare to go into the week into the vineyard that we will be walking in fellowship with you throughout this week and that the weaknesses of the flesh and the pressures of the world around us will not uh, neutralize us and hinder the fruit that you want to produce in us. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy together. Give us wisdom and understanding. Help me to be able to put across these truths clearly and uh, may they make a difference in the way we serve you this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. About a generation ago, <clears throat> Robert Moody and uh, the channeler Elizabeth Kula Ross, who gave him some guidance and counsel, um, published books that were broadly read in the English speaking world and certainly in Germany, where um, we were aware of it as well in Luxembourg. And uh, I remember this being something that was published frequently in magazines and was kind of noised abroad on the radio. Um, the books by Robert Moody talked about the experience of many people who had uh, near-death experiences. You certainly have heard about this because it's been popularized broadly since. That people, when they were very close to death, very often had the sensation of being sucked out of their bodies or being suspended over their bodies, and in many cases being drawn by a kind of presence through a tunnel toward a bright light at the end of the tunnel. And in some cases, people reported coming back, not being allowed to go all the way to the end, and they said, well, we sensed that there was an incredible loving presence at the other end, and we were so disappointed to have to come back into our bodies and get back into the, the, the routine of going to the office the next week. Or maybe it wasn't the next week. When you're that close to death, you don't usually go back to the office the next day. But you understand the drift. What was not always so uh, broadly known is that Robert Moody um, was rather suspect in his research. And uh, he cherry-picked the experiences of various people to put into his book. 
and it became known as well some years afterward, number one, that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross had a great influence on his literature. She is a spiritist and a channeler and involved with the demonic world. Don't know if she's still alive, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And secondly, there were many other experiences, perhaps just as many, of people who had near-death experiences that were unspeakably horrific. They encountered nightmarish scenes of torture and of fire, and uh, they came back with, uh, I don't know if they were shaking, but I mean that they were shaken to the core of their, of their being by the experience that they had. Of course, books that advertise that kind of thing are less likely to become bestsellers. Books that give you the impression that after death there's really nothing to fear, you're going to go down a, a channel and uh, you, you, there's really a painless process of moving out of the body into this place of perfect love and bliss, and you'll never want to leave it. This afternoon I would like to talk about the whole matter of the intermediate state, which is the terminology that's usually used in the theology books for the place that a person goes after his body dies. This is part of a series of studies that we're going to be doing on the first Sundays of the month, Lord willing, going forward, on various themes that relate to what the Bible says about the future. And I'm doing this because uh, Pastor Sam has requested that we talk about some of these things, and I'm trying to put them in some kind of chronological order. We gave last month a kind of an overview in Luke chapter 21 of uh, things that are uh, that were um, foreseen by the Lord Jesus Christ regarding the collapse of the city of Jerusalem and uh, his own prophetic statements about what was going to happen at a yet future time. Tonight, the intermediate state. Next time we're together, um, I'd like to talk. Uh, about a number of other things that will just move us through uh, things chronologically for the church and for believers. Um, there are a number of passages that we're going to look at. The main focus is going to be on Luke 16. So if you have your Bible and you want to follow along and um, always recommend that you come to church with your Bible in hand, this is where we're going to camp out and spend most of our time. But before we get to Luke 16, I would like just to refer to a couple of Old Testament passages without asking you necessarily to refer to them. And then after Luke 16, we're going to go to a few other passages in the New Testament, kind of round out our understanding of this very important matter. And my purpose is twofold. Number one, I want to urge you to be sure about your destiny after death. We live in a culture that doesn't like to talk about death or skates around it in various ways, although there are more and more countries now that are promoting uh, doctor-assisted suicide and uh, promoting the idea that if you wake up uh, some morning and you really have a bad case of the blues, maybe you'd like to kind of unplug, and the state will not be unhappy about that because you will cost a lot less for society in the long term. Death is becoming something um, to be feared no more than a bad rainstorm, and it may have very many benefits for you. My friend, let's not follow that train of thought, because life is sacred, God has given it to us to be valued and to be used and invested in his work, as we just sang a moment ago. 
you need to know where you're headed because it is true that unless the Lord comes to take us home to be with himself, every one of us one day will face death and will pass through death into either eternal death or eternal life. You need to know where you're headed. And number two, in looking particularly at Luke 16, I want to urge us to warn others about the future that is expressed in this passage and related sections of Scripture. On a regular basis, I go to the ophthalmologist for an eye checkup. And you know how it is when you sit down in that chair and he flips a switch and says, please look at the letters on the wall over there. Ever since I was a little boy, I've had a very bad case of bad vision, which is even now after I've uh, had the respective surgeries for ancient people, I still prefer when I'm reading to wear a pair of glasses. And if I don't have assistance, or that's the way it used to be at any rate, I would look at the letters on the wall and he would say, please read them. I, I could make out the E, that's usually the first letter, if my memory is, serves me right. But once I get past the next line, I would be totally lost. Everything was fuzzy, indistinct. Reading the bottom line or the next to the bottom line would be as impossible for me as flying. And that's kind of the way it is on this topic for us, uh, what comes after death. There are many people who have a very fuzzy idea about what comes after you breathe your last. Even those maybe who have grown up in the local church and who have a somewhat of a familiarity with the Bible, it's just not real clear. There's something on the other side of the wall but to read it distinctly, mm, no, that's too difficult. So let's try to bring a little more focus to that. The first thing I want us to think about is what the Old Testament had to say about the intermediate state, that is, between the time when a person dies and the time when he receives a resurrection body. In the Old Testament, we find many passages that tell us that there is conscious life after death, but the picture is a little fuzzy. The reason for this is what we call the progress of Revelation. When we read the first verses of the Bible, we don't have all the information about what God is going to do thousands of years later, unpacked all at the beginning. There are hints. There are promises. There are commands, but we don't have all the details. There's a light on the wall, but we can't quite read it all. We think for example, of Job, who says in Job 19, 26, in my flesh shall I see God. I'm not quite sure exactly when Job was written. There are varying positions on that. Probably he lived in the time of Abraham, about 2000 BC. So that two millennia before the time of Christ, there was a man who lost all of his children on one day, all of his animals in one day, all of his stuff in one day, and after a short time of physical suffering, he lost his health, his good friends came by to give him their counsel. Great friends they were. They were quiet for a week and probably should have remained quiet for a lot longer. And uh, then, of course, this long poem in Old Hebrew launches us into the dialogue between Job and his friends, and they kind of castigate him, 
Say, Job, you know, this wouldn't have happened to you if you were really as good a man as you pretend to be. And Job tends to justify himself. And before God comes and gives him the last word, Job really does rather justify himself. I've been good to orphans. I've been uh, taking old ladies across the street. I've been generous to the poor. I haven't been selfish. I haven't been an egotist. You know, uh, the, you know I, I don't understand God's ways. All the way back then, this man says, in my flesh shall I see God. Is he referring to something that's going to happen in a few months' time? Or is going to have a vision of God? No. The idea is that when I die, there will be some corporal expression of me that will allow me to see my Creator. Or think about David in Psalm 17, who writes, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I will behold thy face in righteousness. David, roughly a thousand years before Christ. And we read in Daniel chapter 12, at the time of the Babylonian captivity, about 500 years before Christ. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Three examples of Old Testament light on the question of what happens to you when you die. But the image is still a little fuzzy. It is clear enough to know that there's something there, but we lack focus. Old Testament passages, there is conscious life after death, but the picture is fuzzy. Let's come to Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. And I want you to see this example from the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, which teaches us that there is indeed conscious life after death, either with God or away from God. And the picture is much clearer. Now before we read this passage, let me give a little bit of context. Because obviously Luke 16 follows what? Luke 15. <laughs> Just want to make sure that you're with me. And in Luke 15, Jesus has spoken about his attitude towards sinners. This is the, that great passage that we looked at in the Vacation Bible School a couple of summers ago. And it's all about lost things and about joy over lost things that are found. And you've got the series of three parables. Got the lost coin, the, the widow who is uh, ecstatic because her coin is found. And you've got the lost sheep. That's actually the first one, isn't it? The shepherd goes and looks for the lost sheep and is all excited when he comes home and has the sheep on his shoulder and he's rescued this little lamb from certain death. And then there's the much longer parable of the uh, lost son which actually really is the parable about the brother of the lost son. We usually call it the parable, parable of the prodigal son, but it's actually the parable about the brother who had no joy at all when the lost son was found and had come to his senses and returned home. The emphasis in Luke 15 is very clear that God rejoices when those who uh, stop justifying themselves uh, repent of their sin and, and come to the Lord. But those who arrogantly justify themselves and who are self-reliant cannot be found. They remain lost. And Luke 15 emphasizes God's initiative in each case in seeking out the lost. The shepherd looks for the sheep. The old woman looks for her coin. The father has his eye out open every day to see if his son is coming across the hill, returning to his home. Luke 
Look at chapter 16, verse 1. And he said also unto his disciples, which seems to bring Luke 15 and Luke 16 together almost seamlessly. This is part of a continuation of the discussion. And when you come to Luke 16, you find out that Luke 16 is talking about money. Kind of maybe picking up on the discussion in the second parable about the lost coin. And uh, you will see in this first parable of Luke 16, we, I don't think we're going to take the time this evening to read it all over. You're probably familiar with it. It's about a man who is a manager for somebody else's business. And um, the fellow who is called a steward is accused of wrongdoing. He's maybe he's been pilfering in the cash box, or maybe he's made some bad investments, and he's wasting the money of the big boss. And so the big boss calls him into the office and says, "My, here's what you're doing. You know, you're fired." And so the steward, who works for the big boss, who is a very sly chap indeed, decides to pick a number of the best clients of the boss. And he goes to them and interviews them and says, hey, tell me, uh, what, what's, uh, what's the balance sheet look like for your accounts with the big boss? And the client says, well, you know, uh, it doesn't look too good. I owe the big boss X number of shekels. And the steward says, let's make a deal. Look, just chop it in half, and we're good to go. He goes to the next client. How much do you owe the big boss? Oh, so many shekels. Cut it in half. And yet to another one. And uh, when the big boss finds out about what the steward has done, he hauls him in again and says, you are really a crafty young fellow. Um, you know, you, you've used my money to make friends for yourself. And um, look at verse 8. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. That's a very ironic use of that word, wisely. It, it, that kind of worldly wisdom, cunning. For, Jesus says, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that is the money, probably, of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, that is when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Use money so that when eternity dawns, those whom you have blessed with your possessions will welcome you into the eternal blessings. And then he continues speaking about money, and here is kind of the core teaching in Luke 16, about money, verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. That's a basic principle, by the way, which is a, a, a great principle to follow when you're thinking about rearing your children or discipling somebody else. You look for faithfulness in a little detail and that will tell you whether the person is going to be trustworthy for larger things. People are not concerned about being faithful in details. You probably can't trust them for the bigger things. What is the little thing Jesus is talking about? Verse 11. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, uh, mammon, that is, in 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 money matters that are not essentially spiritual, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Probing questions. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And everyone applauded. Oh no, sorry, that's not what it says. Verse 14. The Pharisees also, 
who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. You want to get pushed back, preach about money, right? Everybody likes to talk about money, but we don't like to be convicted about abuses of worldly things. And Jesus said, verse 15, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. That is, you're falling all over each other to push your way into the kingdom which John the Baptist put on offer for the people of Israel. And you're convinced that you're worthy of it, and you're, you're going to make it in. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. Whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. One of the strange statement that is put in here by Luke. What does that have to do with John? Uh, with, with money, I'm sorry. What does, uh, what does divorce have to do with money? Well, in many cases it has a lot to do with money. And these men, these Pharisees who were masters of the law, were probably in the process of putting away certain wives for financial reasons. Now, verses 10 to 18 are kind of the core teaching section of the chapter. Luke 16 begins with a parable about how to use riches. Then there's teaching about riches. And now we finish off the section from verses 19 to 31 with another parable, which I think shows us that the major teaching is bookended with these two parables about the same topic. Look at verse 19. <clears throat> there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and was buried. And in hell, or in Hades, Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, nah, Father Abraham, no, no, no. If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Isn't this a curious passage? 
The beginning of the chapter in Luke 16 starts with a parable. It's almost certain that the beginning of the chapter is a story that Jesus is framing, which is not the latest item in the Jerusalem Times that morning. This is a parable, it's a story with a spiritual lesson. When you get to the end of the chapter, to bookend the teaching on money, do we have a parable or do we have a true account? There is debate about this among Bible students. <clears throat> Some would say that this is perhaps a true account. One reason being that this is the only parable in the whole New Testament where a proper name is included in a story like this. If it is a parable, why does Jesus talk about Lazarus? In parables, the people are archetypes. They are they're individuals that represent uh, ideas or movements in the world, uh, personalities that might be, you could say, well, this guy is like some other person. <clears throat> this particular man's name, Lazarus, which is the uh, Greek form of the name Eliezer, whom God has helped, um, is a name that's not uncommon in the time of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> the rich man is named, did you pick up the name of the rich man? Did you see it there? His name is Anonymous, uh, which is the name of many people in parables. He, he's not even given the, the dignity of uh, the name that he carried. And certainly he was like many rich men <clears throat> who die and whose names are completely forgotten. Um, but not only do you have Lazarus mentioned by name, but you also have Abraham whose name is mentioned. He is a real character. So maybe it's a true account. That's possible. But on the other hand, it could also be a parable, which I think on balance, at least as I look at it, right now, unless you can help me to see it differently, seems more probable. Perhaps Jesus is using this format to tell his story because he's using the language of the rabbis. Rabbis would tell stories like this using references to Abraham or mentioning specific people. And um, there's one very well-known tale that the rabbis told about a dialogue between Abraham and Nimrod. Of course, Abraham and Nimrod didn't live at the same time, so it's obviously a, a fable kind of a, a format. Um, if it is a parable, then it matches the parable at the beginning of the talk about money and kind of balances it out. In the first case, the rich man is wise. He's the steward of the big boss. He's even sly in using what belongs to his master in order to make friends for himself when he knew he'd be in need. And in the second parable, the rich man is placed outside the body <clears throat> after his own death, and he's presented as a pitiful character. So in parable number one, the rich man, who is dishonest, is presented in a rather positive light, because at least he has the common sense to realize that he needs to use money to build relationships. In the second case, the, the rich man has built no relationships with Lazarus, who's at his door, and to whom he throws the scraps of his garbage. What is the thrust of this passage? We'll say something about the intermediate state in just a moment, but. Let's just make a few comments about the main thrust of the passage in its context. Because the purpose is not, first of all, to teach us all about the intermediate state. <clears throat> this is not a, um, a little paragraph in a theology book that gives you a list of scripture passages and using systematic theology gives you this point and that point and the following point. It, is, it has its own particular context. And it would be wise for us to make some practical applications before we talk about the intermediate state. 
In 16, 1 to 13, this story about homes on the earth contrasted with verses 14 to 31, which is a story about eternal dwellings, you've got a focus on um, the eternal destiny of people in both parables. In the first one, the steward shows mercy on debtors and he finds mercy for himself. The happy clients are going to give him another job, although they'll take him into their homes after he's lost his job. He shows mercy to them, he receives mercy from, from his clients. In the second parable, the rich man shows no mercy for Lazarus. And when he dies, he himself finds no mercy at the hand of Lazarus because it was not permitted. There's a great gulf fixed between Lazarus and the rich man. And, and those contrasts are there if you will read the whole chapter and not just read one little section. And the applications in each section are very clear. In verses 1 to 13, it's very clear that Jesus says to use money as a means and not as, as an object. Don't worship your stuff. Use the things that God puts in your hands to serve other people, to minister to other people. Uh, do not be enslaved to it. Use it in the service of the Lord. Verses 14 to 31, to the center section and the second parable, show us that God hates the love of money, which, contrary to the views of many Jewish people in the time of Jesus, um, money was no proof of, uh, of fitness or worthiness to enter the kingdom. The Pharisees were trying to push into the kingdom without any repentance. If they were um, wealthy people, and many of these religious leaders in Judaism were very well set, they were politically connected, they believed that there was a certain logic in the, the law of Moses. Do you remember how the law of Moses worked? If you will obey me, I will bless you. Therefore, everyone who seemed to have material blessings necessarily was being obedient to God. So if you were rich, that's God's stamp of approval on your real character. Not true. Read through the Psalms and you will find that David and other psalmists talk about the rich man who hates God and who is sleek and fat, grotesquely so, and is mocked in the Psalms. And the, the, there's the famous Psalm, I think it's 36 or 37, where David says, I, I was tempted almost to envy the guy. <laughs> and then I looked at his end. Oh, that shows us a different perspective. Look at the final end of the fat, sleek, rich man. And you'll see that the bottom line of all of this is that Jewish people must listen to the Law and the Prophets, which demand love for God as the core issue. They must not be satisfied with their material abundance. And they must not satisfy, or they, they must not congratulate themselves into saying, uh, we have material abundance, therefore God must be happy with us. And so before we go into some of these details on the eternal state, think a moment about how you use the things that God has put in your hand. Do you worship your things? Do you live for them? It's always interesting to uh, drive down the auto route and see cars passing as we're coming to church sometimes, to Ben Almadina, depending on the hour of the day. A Ferrari will pass us at lightning speed or a huge Porsche. If you have a Ferrari or Porsche, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> and you know, I don't think I've ever seen one of those cars that isn't absolutely in exquisite shape. They are polished, well-maintained, and I think that if I had a Ferrari, I would polish it and maintain it too. 
And it is possible for us to become really obsessed with our Ferraris, whatever they might be, and to prostrate ourselves before them and serve them. And we forget that we become slaves of the ones, of the things that we serve. And we're not supposed to do that. God says, I want you to love me and use the things I've given you. You may enjoy them, but use them for higher ends, for higher purposes. What then does this second parable teach us about the eternal state, uh, the intermediate state, excuse me, not the eternal state, that's something different, as we'll see later. What does the second parable teach us about the intermediate state, that is, that time between the death of a person, whether saved or lost, and the time of the resurrection of the body? There are a couple of observations I'd like to make. We've read the passage, and so you're familiar with it. I'd just like to make a couple of observations as we uh, go through a number of these verses. First of all, in regard to verse 22, I want you to notice the radical reversal of this life's fortunes that is possible in the life to come. In the life to come, the life after death, there is possible a complete reversal of fortunes. Now that goes in both directions. Lazarus, if you were to see him today begging in front of a Koviran or a, uh, some other place where beggars gather hoping to get a few bits of free food, you would say this is kind of a sorry fellow. Um, why doesn't he get a job? Uh, he must be an illegal. Don't you have an education? Do you have a family? And then if you look at the person who owns Kovina, who happens to come by, maybe in his Ferrari, I don't know, and you say, well, that's an admirable person who really knows how to work and achieve something when you go to the other side of the casket, things are exactly the opposite. Certainly picked that up when we were reading the parable. The beggar dies and is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. It's a despicable picture of this beggar who is dirty, diseased, reduced to feeding on the garbage. The dogs come by to lick on his putrefying sores, which would certainly have aggravated his condition. I don't recommend that you have dogs lick your sores if you're sick. Uh, go to the pharmacist, go to the doctor. This man is in bad shape. But the rich man, who is anonymous, uh, is almost passed over as being an insignificant person. The rich man dies and he's buried. Basta. Close the casket, put it into the ground. Well, I guess that's a bit of it. We're imposing our Western burial practices, aren't we? Because they didn't put this man in a casket. They put him into some kind of a bag and put him into. Probably a very expensive tomb hewn out of the rock. But the rich man is foolish. And you can tell he's foolish because Jesus pokes fun at him even all the way back in verse 19. He's clothed in purple. You like purple? Maybe you say, I wouldn't be caught dead in a, dead in a purple suit, especially if you're a man. But to, for a man, in this context, to be clothed in purple means that he always buys Art Schaffner Marks, or um, I mean, he's decked out in a 1,000 euro suit. And it also says that he was dressed in fine linen. That was his underwear. 
This man does his shopping at the Champs Elysees in the Paris, or in Madrid to the Prado, or whatever the fancy stores are there in the big Avenida. And furthermore, he fared sumptuously every day. Here's a fellow who not only has an opulent lifestyle, but he's a hedonist. He's a jet set character who spends his time in the nightclubs and the bars dancing away. His worries in sailing to distant ports, for pleasure on his elegant yacht. You get the idea. The, the rich man is the man that the world envies, but his life is empty. And he's going to face judgment and a radical reversal of fortunes. Lazarus is down at the beginning. He rises to the top at the end. The rich man is at the top at the beginning. He's at the bottom at the end. The, the point we want to make is that when you get past the grave, there is possible a radical reversal of fortunes in life to come. Most people that we meet on the street don't like to think about that. Many people try to run away from those thoughts and drown themselves in pointless amusement or holiday upon holiday or mindless work. The fact is that beyond the grave, we must be prepared for the possibility of a radical reversal of fortunes. Number two, verses 24 and 25. The text tells us in Jesus' teaching about the intermediate state that there are only two possibilities in the afterlife. There is comfort or there is misery. There is no purgatory mentioned in this passage. The notion of purgatory has been imported into Roman Catholic teaching and is accepted, I suppose, even by maybe some Protestants, although it is a particularly Roman Catholic concept. It was imported much later as a means of dealing with the problem of mortal sin and venial sin, and the idea of purgatory is that if you have committed sins of lesser importance, you can kind of pay them off in a place that is between <clears throat> heaven and hell. And it is a place of suffering where even the popes will go, and so if you pray for the pope, you need to pray that he'll be delivered as soon as possible from purgatory. And you can pay money when you have a funeral mass said for a deceased relative. But Jesus never talks about purgatory, nor do any other Old or New Testament passages ever give any hint that there is such a thing. There are only two places mentioned. Verse 25 talks about Abraham's bosom. In the time before the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, comfort was in paradise. Jesus says to the brigand who is crucified next to him and who believes in Jesus, uh, having changed his mind because the compare the text, you find that at the beginning of the crucifixion time, both of the robbers were um, yelling abuse at Jesus. And by the time you get to the end, one of them has been converted and the other one remains in his hostile uh, frame of mind. <clears throat> and Jesus says to the one who converts, this day you will be with me in paradise. In this uh, parable, it's referred to as the place of Abraham's bosom. It's a place of comfort. It's a place of rest. But there is also a place of misery, which is referred to in verse 23 as hell, or Hades is the word that is used in the New Testament text. This is the part of the abode of the, abed, uh, the, abode of the dead, referred to in the Old Testament as Sheol, where the lost people go. Sheol is the abode of the dead, and Sheol, or in Hades, in Hades, 
before Christ rose from the dead, there was a place in that domain that was Abraham's bosom, and there was a place of comfort, and there was another part of it that was separated from it that was a place of torment and misery. This is a temporary place of suffering and torment that is short of the lake of fire, which is referred to in the book of Revelation, and Jesus also talks about Gehenna, which is the equivalent of the lake of fire. It's a kind of temporary place of confinement before a sentence is passed and one goes into his punishment. <coughs> two possibilities, not three, four, five, six. There are two options. Verse 24 also indicates that there is no such thing as soul sleep after death. Because the rich man cries out to Abraham and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And Lazarus, he, he says, could come and dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. Lazarus is conscious, is normally able to be active. The rich man is active, he is conscious. No indication here of soul sleep. And there are various pseudo-Christian groups that would claim that there, there is this condition of the soul between death and the resurrection where you're just not conscious of anything. Jesus certainly doesn't seem to give that impression in this parable. A fourth thing that I observe in verse 25 is that the consequences that are meted out after death are just. You see how Abraham frames this. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. You're getting what you deserved. There is a, an emphasis on justice here. A fifth observation, verse 26, there are no second chances. And furthermore, the salvation that is received cannot be lost. So the rich man cannot say, you know what, I was really a fool. I, I repent. Uh, uh, I believe everything that I was told, and I renounce my worship of my goods, and now I want to be right with God. Too late. Should have thought about that earlier. It's kind of like taking your Ferrari down to A7 and having a huge accident. And the policeman comes and asks you, assuming you survive, may I see your insurance papers? Oh, I don't have any insurance. But great idea. I think I'll run down right now and sign up with Mutfrey and get myself a really good insurance bond. The policeman will say, sir, you are out of order. It's too late. You need to deal with these things ahead of time. And furthermore, for Lazarus, there is no indication here that Lazarus is going to be in Abraham's bosom for a little while, and then maybe he'll end up in Hades. That certainly doesn't make any sense in this parable, does it? There are no second chances, and the salvation received cannot be lost. There is security for those who are in God's family, and there is eternal lostness for those who are against him. Another thing I find that's very striking in verse 28 is that the unsaved dead would be preachers of the gospel if they could come back. Yeah. Striking, isn't it? All of a sudden, this man, who's been living for himself, is concerned about his brothers. i got five brothers. I wonder if they were younger or they were older. Maybe it was the kid brother. It doesn't really matter, does it? But he's concerned about his family. And send Lazarus here, raise him from the dead so that they won't come into this place of torment. This is no place to come. I've invited them to the bars, I've invited them to my parties, but I don't want them to get here. So please do something to warn them. Verse 
And then uh, what I suppose is the most amazing statement of all in verse 31. Those who rebuff the testimony of the scriptures will not be convinced even by seeing a resurrected man. Abraham says to the rich man in Hades, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you know, that's the way it actually turned out for some of those Pharisees and priests. When Jesus rose from the dead, there were some who continued to reject him as the Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel, despite the evidence. And they went to Pilate, and they, con they contrived a little story that the disciples had come and invaded the garden, well, if it wasn't the garden tomb, wherever the tomb was, they broke the seal, moved the stone around, and hauled off the body. Not sure exactly how the soldiers who were standing guard there and who saw bright light and knocked flat on their feet, how they actually worked all this out, it was a matter of intrigue and dinero. And they refused the evidence. And they said, we will not believe that he is the Messiah. If you don't believe the record of scripture, you will not be convinced even by the most amazing evidence. Now let me round this out with just a couple more passages. Because the third group of texts, which we're going to deal with very briefly, show that Jesus' resurrection from the dead opened the door for deceased believers in Abraham's bosom to be directly in God's presence, even before the resurrection day. So that, going back to the ophthalmologist's imagery, not only do we have focus, but God adds a very important new line in the text for us to read. That if you are a believer today and your body dies, you don't go to Abraham's bosom anymore. You do not go to Hades, to Hades. You go into the presence of the Lord Jesus himself. Why is that? Some clues. Look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. This is worth another hour of study to give in the details, and um, Pastor Sam can do that on another occasion. Ephesians 4, 8 says, Wherefore he saith, the context is the gifts that Christ gives by grace. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Two possibilities. One is that Jesus descended to the lower parts of the earth, that is, the earth itself. He came from heaven to the lower part of the cosmos, the earth, so that he could rise again from the dead. Or the other possibility is that Jesus, when he died, went into Hades, the place, the abode of the dead, where he proclaimed his victory over sin and death. And when he ascended, when, when he resurrected and ascended, he took the souls of Old Testament believers into the presence of God and gave gifts to the church. If you look at Philippians, just a couple of pages later, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, you see Paul in prison talking about how he feels torn about whether it would be better to go on living in the flesh or to depart. And he says, for I am in a strait, a tight corner, betwixt two, having a desire to depart, that is to, to depart this life, and to be with Christ, which is far better. He does not say, I hope to be with Father Abraham, 
but to be with Christ. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ himself. And then one final passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We finish with this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, talk about the intermediate state as well and give us kind of the, um, I don't want to say maybe the last word, but maybe a very complete view of what we can anticipate if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. What happens to us after death? Paul writes to the Corinthians in verse 1, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle or this tent were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, that is, in this building, our present body, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame things, God, who hath uh, also given unto us the earnest, that is the down payment of the Spirit, therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror that is the fear of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. A couple thoughts. The context in the end of chapter 4 shows that he is referring here to the eternal state. You can take a moment and look back at verses 11 and 12 and verse 16. He's talking about uh, the deterioration of the outward man and the coming of what is eternal after death. The description that is given is uh, uh, dual. We are body and soul and you can't pull down a zipper and have body on one side and soul on the other side. The, the, the whole relationship of the mind and the brain, for example, is a mystery that no one can explain. The mind exists independently of the brain, but until you die, the mind and the brain are intimately related, and you cannot separate them. Um, eternal life is um, something that includes the invisible and the spiritual and the material. We are always going to live in a material body that will be transformed when the resurrection comes. But before the resurrection, how are you going to express your mind? There are many people, when they think about the intermediate state, as if a, a person who has departed this life is a kind of a wandering essence. Um, you know, people will tell you, and people have talked to me about this. I remember earlier in our ministry, uh, we did a funeral for a family that said that uh, they, the, the person woke up late at night and sensed their mother at the foot of the bed. <laughs> and it was just a presence. And we know she. How do you know? Well, I didn't press the matter because these were unsaved people. But they came regularly to the church. And I, I, I just sensed. I, I, know, I know what my mother's like. That was my mother at the foot of the bed. Well, you couldn't see her. Couldn't smell her. You didn't hear her flapping her wings. It was just a presence, they said that they sense. And a lot of people think about the ongoing spiritual something of people. And that's all there is that's left. But when you look at the testimony of Scripture, 
you will always see this merger of something tangible and material and something non-physical, immaterial. And how that's actually going to get fleshed out in the intermediate state, we're not quite sure from Scripture. This passage is a puzzle for many Bible students. Some would believe that the house that's being referred to in chapter 5 is the house that Christ is preparing for his people. John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many mansions. And one of the reasons that Jesus is delaying is that he is building a place for his people. And maybe the, the things that are used to create that eternal dwelling place for God's people is what we send up ahead. There might be an allusion to this in 1 Timothy 6. Or you build a good foundation for the future by the way you use your things. There are others who suggest that this um, building that we're going to be clothed upon is some kind of a temporary... Um, well, a body that's not really the resurrection body, referred to maybe as a tent, a tabernacle here, something temporary. When you go to Revelation chapter 5, you remember, or I guess it's chapter 6, where you see the souls under the altar who are crying out. It's the fifth seal judgment, and the souls cry out to God and say, how long are you going to put up with this? Bring justice to the situation in the world. This is horrific. The souls are crying out to God in John's vision. How do the souls cry out if they don't have lips and vocal cords? We don't know. But isn't it interesting to see in Luke 16 that the rich man experiences some kind of pain in torment so that he wants a drop of water put on his tongue you say, well, that's just a story, it's just a parable. Don't press the details. Well, it's Jesus who's giving the parable, so I better listen very carefully. One thing is very clear in verses 3 to 4. And in verse 8 and 9. And that is that when the soul leaves the body, There is conscious existence, and we know that we are in the presence of Christ. This is not the end because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the church and either resurrects us because we have already died, or translates us and changes the body of those who are still alive when he returns, in either case, Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will receive a body that is eternal and that can never be destroyed. Until he comes to do that, if you die, you are in the presence of Christ, and there is apparently some way for you to express who you are, and your identity is not some kind of a vague puff of smoke. It is a real place, and it is a place of delight if we know him. When he comes back, the scriptures tell us that those who are part of his church will come back to reign with him. They will share his glory. They will be at the banquet table with Abraham and the patriarchs and will fit the establishment of his kingdom. And so believers do not need to shrink from the actual event of death because the stinger's been taken out. We may shrink at the anticipation of enduring pain before we die, but death holds no threat for one who's placed his trust in Christ. Yeah. We don't have to be worried about that. Those who are lost, who have never trusted in Christ, whether they are rich or poor, must shrink from the consequences of death because of what Jesus said and what the rest of the Bible tells us. There is life after death. Some years ago, we spoke before we left Luxembourg with a friend of ours 
in Luxembourg who is an amateur astrologer, uh, not an astrologer, an amateur astronomer. And uh, he's an older man who knows that his days are numbered. He's married to a French gal who's a little younger than he is. And uh, he's a man with a tremendous sense of humor and kind of laughs at life quite a bit. But laughs at some things that he really shouldn't laugh about. And one of them is the reality of death. And he said, the days are going to come. Maybe you'll not see us again. And, uh, you know, my wife and I will have passed off this world and we'll just be one of those stars out there. Or we'll be nothing. We'll just kind of disappear into the blackness. That's the end of us. And we didn't have a lengthy discussion on that because we covered it in other times when we read the Bible together. But uh, I said, you know, I don't believe that's true at all. Because Jesus made it very clear that there is an existence after death and that we need to be ready for it. Not something to be feared if we know the Lord. Something to really get serious about when we think about lost people who live on our street. Because if they don't hear the gospel and trust the gospel, they're going to be in the situation of the rich man. Are we concerned about them? Yeah, should be. We ought to be. If you don't yet know Christ, don't brush this off as just another fable from Christian sources. This is real stuff. This is true. You need to take it seriously. If you put your trust in Christ, thank the Lord before you go to bed tonight that you're one of His. Amen. Father, we thank you for the security that we have in Christ and that what Lazarus, that poor man in the parable, experienced would never be taken away from him. Not because he was poor, there was no particular virtue in being poor, but this was a man who believed in the promises given to Old Testament Jews. And we are called to believe the promises that you give to us. That whoever believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, can be saved and be saved forever. So help us to trust in these things and to make the gospel good news known around us this week. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.